there are few thinkers who have had more influence on technology, or at least thinking about technology, than the writer and entrepreneur Ray Kurzweil. Ray's just come out with a new book, How to Create a Mind. It's a great honor to have him on TechCrunch TV today. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, welcome to Keen On Show. Great to be with you on TechCrunch once again. Ray, why should entrepreneurs read your book? Your new book, that well, is, How to Create a Mind. How does it connect with what we're doing here in Silicon Valley? There's probably nothing more important than intelligence. It's the most important force in the universe. And right now we're giving machines more intelligence and more intelligence machines will always win in the end. We see that the most intelligent weapon systems win, the most intelligent search engine. There's a battle now between Apple Siri and Google Now which one will be better at understanding the hierarchy of human language and accessing human knowledge and guiding people. Uh, so the best, I think, source to understand how to create more intelligent machines is to uh, look at the, mo the best example we have of human intelligence, which is the human brain itself. And it's only recently that we can actually see inside the brain with enough precision and clarity and resolution to actually understand what's going on. Uh, fMRI images kind of tell you where things are happening, but now we can see individual interneural connections. We can see your brain create your thoughts. We can see your thoughts create your brain. Some of the best evidence for how the neocortex works, which is the part of the brain where we do our thinking, came out just as I was sending off the book to the publisher. Uh, and we're seeing now, really just recently, very viscerally impressive examples of artificial intelligence like Watson that got a higher score than the best two human Jeopardy players put together and uh, systems like uh, Siri and Google Now and the Google self-driving cars and uh, things which you described 10 years ago and which I did describe 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, would have seemed crazy but actually exist now. Ray, is this what you call singularity? Well, singularity is kind of the implications of what I call the law of acceleration, which is exponential growth and, and progress of information technology, both in hardware and software. Going back to the 1890 census, computers have gained exponentially in price performance. They're trillions of times more powerful for the same cost uh, than they were a century ago. Billions of times more powerful just since I was a student. And it's not just hardware. Software is actually making greater gains than hardware. I make that point in this new book, How to Create a Mind. And this will ultimately lead to computers that really do operate at human levels, which I've been consistent at uh, saying will happen by 2029. They'll then be able to combine the human powers of pattern recognition, because that is the strength of the human uh, brain, with the scale and speed of computers. So consider Watson, and actually, it got its knowledge by reading Wikipedia and other encyclopedias. It wasn't hand-coded by the scientists. And if it reads one page of Wikipedia, it does not do as good a job as you and I do in understanding that one page. But whatever level of understanding it has, it applied it to actually 200 million pages of natural language documents, Wikipedia and other encyclopedias and can remember all that and has total recall of it and tremendous speed and can sift through it in three seconds, you and I can't do that. So it therefore actually did a better job than the best two human players put together. Uh, once they can actually read and understand human knowledge at human levels and read everything that's out there, every book and every website, it'll be a very impressive combination. Uh, IBM's already applying Watson to actually have a system that will read every medical journal article and every medical blog all the thousands that come out every day, which no human doctor can do, and act as an, exp an actual practical human expert on medical diagnosis and uh, remediation. Ray, how, uh, how primitive will Watson or Siri seem in 2029 when you said uh, machines and human intelligence will essentially be combined? Well, uh, technology from 20 years ago always seems primitive because it's growing exponentially and exponential growth is not intuitive. Our brain actually expects progress to be linear, that things will go one, two, three, four, five. So at step 30, you're at 30. The reality is that uh, computer technology, hardware and software, communications, even biological technologies like genetic sequencing progress exponentially, two, four, eight, sixteen 
At step 30, you're at a billion. And that's not just an idle speculation about the future. This computer, for example, is actually several billion times more powerful per dollar than the computer I used when I was a student. And we'll do that again in 25 years. Uh, so go out 20 years, doubling every year. It's actually doubling faster than that. Uh, computers will be millions of times more powerful in hardware. We'll have uh, made far, uh, far greater software gains. Our knowledge of the brain and how it works is also expanding exponentially. The spatial resolution of brain scanning, the amount of da data we're getting, the scale and precision of simulations, all is scaling up exponentially. And we can actually have enough, we have enough data now and, in, and neuroscience research which I cite in the book, and also we can do our own thought experiments and how the human brain deals with things like language to describe the basic algorithm of the neocortex, and I do that in the book. Ray, you, uh, you were the founder of Nuance, the natural language search engine. That's correct, right? Right. I founded Kurzweil Computer Products and sold it to Xerox, and Xerox spun it out into a company that is now Nuance which is a $7 billion leader in uh, artificial intelligence technologies like speech recognition and uh, character recognition and speech synthesis technologies, all of which go back to my original right. technology. Right, and, and, and it's, it's self-evident that Nuance has an important, or companies like Nuance have an important role to play in the narrative you're describing in your new book. There are going to be a lot of entrepreneurs in our audience who want to jump on this train too. Um, what are the areas, do you think, uh, in which there are the, the, the richest, the most exciting entrepreneurial opportunities for young technology startups? Well, there's actually a lot of things uh, that play into this. One is just the ongoing uh, improvements in hardware. So electronics, computers, communication technologies all have an important role to play. Biotechnology. Uh, is going to enable us to reprogram our biochemistry. That's a big revolution that's kind of, that's already started, but it hasn't really fully hit clinical practice. But there's very exciting things actually now rolling out. We'll see major changes in our ability to reprogram biology away from diseases like heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's over the next decade. That's a big area. Neuroscience is actually now finally, as I said, be able to see inside the brain with enough precision to actually give us biologically inspired methods. So neuroscience is a very exciting area. And it's not just one project. There's many ways of going about this and kind of inferring what goes on inside the human brain. Study of human language is important because that's a gateway to human intelligence. Our knowledge is expressed in language. So natural language understanding, which I'm working on now, uh, is a very important area. We have all this information and knowledge tied up in natural language documents, books, websites. We need to do more than just keyword searches. We need to actually have our computers read that material and understand it, uh, what the content is. Watson did that to some extent. And uh, the ability to do that is going to increase greatly. You go out even five years, you'll see search engines that really understand uh, what those pages mean. And then the searches will be based on that. And you'll be able to ask them questions and really get intelligent answers from a system that has understood the content. Ray, um, the, the Silicon Valley entrepreneur and thinker, uh, Peter Thiel has said that technology hasn't advanced in the last 50 years. You obviously would disagree, but to get to 2029, do we need new companies? Or could this great revolution be achieved by companies like IBM and Google and Microsoft and Facebook? Well. We get from here to there, not through one big leap, not through one grand government program, but actually uh, through thousands, many thousands of, of uh, steps, uh, creating a better search engine, a better app, you know, a better map system, uh, Google Glass, which will put us in augmented reality. I mean, this, and uh, this is all done by entrepreneurs and small companies, and we have now a great democratization of the tools of innovation. Uh, you know, a kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more power and intelligent uh, search capability and knowledge than the President of the United States did 15 years ago. A kid with a notebook computer started Facebook. A couple of kids with notebook computers started Google. 
And uh, there's many examples now of actually high school kids with their tools that are that everybody has. Uh, for example, a uh, high school kid that recently developed an early test for pancreatic cancer, which is what, what is vitally needed in that field. It's now being medically adopted. There's many examples of this. We have a great democratization of the tools of creativity and the ability to access uh, the markets. And it's affecting everything from politics. Uh, Arab Spring was started you know, by a kid with a notebook computer and a Facebook account uh, to social, cultural, and technological revolutions. Ray, final, very, final question, very briefly. This great revolution you're describing, how does it impact the mind itself, the human mind? Does it stay the same as we re-engineer it or reverse engineer it? And perhaps keep your answer down to 30 seconds on this one. Well, we, we've created tools to, to overcome the limitations of our own brain. So there was controversy about calculators when I went to college. Kids are going to forget how to calculate and do arithmetic. And that's actually true. They did forget that, but the calculators didn't go away. We now have access to all of human knowledge at some level with a few keystrokes with devices we carry around. So we rely on that. We rely on these, this outsourcing of our personal, social, historical, cultural memories to our machines, but that's not gonna go away either. And we're able to actually concentrate on where we still have an edge, which is in creativity and creating new knowledge and solving problems. Uh, I, I believe these machines are part of who we are. It's not some alien invasion of intelligent machines from Mars. We created these tools to make ourselves smarter, and we're smarter already because of them. Well, there you have it, the future of the human mind in 30 seconds. There's only one guy who can do that, Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> Ray, thank you so much for appearing on TechCrunch TV, and I certainly hope you'll come back again before 2029 when machines and the human mind converge. Thank you so much, Ray. Yeah, it's a date. <laughs>